welcome back to the channel everyone and today is going to be a fairly simple watercolor landscape and it's going to be corn rolls now corn rolls are i'm sure not just a british or english phenomenon they are um, probably sort of the way that uh, modern industry harvests corn and hay or wheat or whatever it is all around the world now many years ago nostalgically in england uh, we had farmland that was graced in uh, the elms uh, that were iconic in their shape and form and giant haystacks with families and hay wicks and carts all doing the business in September of bringing in the harvest and storing it. So yeah, that's sort of really a, a heyday and it's all gone and it's all disappeared and Dutch elm disease killed all the elms. So sadly, that's no longer a vision of England that uh, youngsters today can witness. In fact, I barely remember any of it. So with that said, modern, in, modern industry and technology created ways of, of harvesting and storing um, straw and uh, barley or wheat or whatever it is and they came up with corn rolls now they formed a very very iconic shape in their own right over the years and formed the uh, centerpiece of many people's uh, landscape paintings during the September period at the countryside and yeah why not they're lovely they're good fun and uh, we all know what they are and what they look like and that's that's cool uh, but in interestingly enough uh, in recent years one has seen some what they call giant uh, rectangular uh, bales again so you know it's actually coming away from these rolls now uh, in, back to square ones I don't know why but obviously there must be a reason for that in the meantime I'm drawing in my normal 4B pencil and uh, just trying to get the shapes affirmed and, and lead in lines to um, sort of draw the, the viewer into the whole picture and a large tree behind which will give me the uh, support and height now the, uh, the, the colors now the colors I'm using now are always the same uh, 17 that have been in my palette and the details can be found in the descriptions below with all the other descriptions and links to all the other parts uh, that I produce and talk about but the additional colors are not there by chance because I've been using those in the past at different times but I've always carried a second uh, palette around just a small palette with six or eight colors in and I wanted to, uh, how shall I put it, minimize um, what I carry around in a way. is It's not so much that it's heavy. It's also the fact that it's quite awkward to try and, especially when you're outside painting, to get two palettes out, have them sit on the uh, board or whatever you're using in some sense without making a whole mess of the whole thing. So I felt that uh, the lovely Craig Young box that I use uh, is far too nice nicely put together a precision made brass watercolor uh, box I just wish it had more um, apertures to take paint something like 24 would be fantastic and still come up with the sort of design that I've got there well I haven't got that so what I felt that I wanted to do was I used a rubberized glue, one that I remember from school that many of you might remember or know of is called Copy Dex, and it is just a rubberized solution. And it therefore would glue some empty pans to a few of my trays that I can work around and have a reduced area. But also, if it really didn't work out, the glue would uh, come away, would, it would just peel off, and uh, I would have no damage to the uh, receptacle at all, and therefore um, not damage my lovely box. 
But if it did work out, I felt that it would be great and it would be an easier way of, of incorporating those new colours uh, without taking two lots of pans around. Now, the colours that I'm using, and again, they're in the description below, and that are, um, at the top is quinacridone gold, and then below that is cadmium red, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Then there's viridian and a lovely cobalt turquoise. I think that's what it is, but it is one of the turquoise family. And then below that I've got Prussian blue for very few or odd times. And then below that one of my favorite blues is cerulean blue. Now the mixes that you've seen me do so far is a little bit of cobalt and cerulean for the sky. And then I put a little bit of uh, red into that to bring it warmer as it came down to the horizon. And all my field colors so far have been ranging around raw sienna and a little bit of the yellow from, well actually it was the quinacridone gold that I put in. And now I'm mixing up some of the um, colors that I need, which is a, sort of the viridian and a bit of indigo and just making a very greenish but dirty grayish color, which is the base color for the tree or the block of trees behind. Now the, I said this is not just about playing with some new colors. This is also about playing with some new brushes. And throughout this video, I do end up going back to my other brushes for the final parts. But to begin with, I just felt that I wanted, I had this brush given to me many years ago. It's a Chinese brush. I don't know if it's a quality one or not. In fact, I'm not that worried. It was just having some fun with it. And I've seen a lot of uh, YouTubers out there, artist YouTubers that are using watercolor brushes, um, which are, again is, is a, an acceptable device for doing watercolor in. We just in England have not so used to seeing it. Um, and I'm sure in other places too. But I think they're a wonderful brush to uh, when you see some of the artists that use them and some of the remarkable paintings that they come up with using these brushes. So I felt that having been given one, it was only right that I should actually try and use it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm having a play with a Chinese brush. And you'll see later that I use one of the um, new ones that I was given to try out from Rosemary and Company, which is that of a mop type. Well, it's not actually. It's a sword liner, but it is in squirrel um, hair. So it makes it extremely floppy um, when wet. It, it's, it's quite a... Um, a, a, an unwieldy type brush in a way but it's a fantastic brush I've got to say because it it can sort of flip and flop around and do all sorts of wonderful things under your control uh, to create branches and bushes and shrubs and all sorts of nice things like that so you'll see me use that further into this painting but eventually I will go back to my normal rounds and uh, other brushes that I commonly use Now I'm just sort of using, uh, as I said, I pick up that sword liner, a squirrel. You can see how floppy those are, or maybe not from the way I'm painting, but they're leaving delicate little marks because that has got that brush has got a wonderful long tip to it. Um, as the the uh, shorter hairs be, go into the longer ones, and it just tapers off to this wonderful but floppy end to it. <laughs> Only way I can describe it really, but it's great because you can flick it around. Actually, those of you who saw my other video where I did a lot of rant, not ranting, but rambling on about things when I was painting that riverbank from Africa, I actually used it in the tree there um, to create the wood and the bark and the tree effects in that painting. So it's not the first time I've used this one, but I do enjoy playing around with it. And it's sort of breaking up that structure behind, whether it's a, well, it's actually a large collection of trees. 
Um, whether I'm bringing that off or not, I don't know. But I'm just having a bit of fun. And hopefully you're enjoying watching this. And, you know, if you are watching it, uh, you can stop this any time you like. And you can get your own watercolours out and have a play yourself. You don't need fancy brushes. You don't actually need all the different colours that I'm using. You can make um, other colours up to mimic what I'm doing. Uh, there are several other colours that you could use. Yellow ochres instead of raw siennas. Uh, lemon yellows instead of uh, quinacridone gold. Pinch that with a little bit of red into it. Um, there are so many other combinations. And your blues and your greens don't have to be uh, indigos and viridian. It can be tholocyanines. It can be other uh, terra vert um, and other colours that you can use to um, create very, very similar effects. It's just these are the colors that I have, I use and prefer. So now I'm using a little bit of umber to mix into that green that I've been using so far and just to dirty it up. Now there's a little bit of thalo going in and that's quite a that's quite a, a bluish green and on its own it's quite an aggressive green so be careful when you use that I heard people or have heard people to say to steer clear of it because it is a an unwieldy beast uh, is thalo green but you know it can be um, but if you know how to treat it then it's like anything else if you treat it right it will work right for you and I rarely, if ever, and this is the, the thing that I would say about Thalo Green, that if you've got it in your palette, try not to or avoid best use not to use it on its own. On its own, it is let out the bag. Wow, you're going to know you've put it on your paper and you're going to probably wish you hadn't. But if you mix it into your palette, with many other different colors at the time. You can mix it with oranges, with greens. You see there that I'm pretty much mixing it now with um, some translucent orange. And it changes the whole dynamic of that green color. So on its own, no, nah, it's a no-no. You know, avoid it in that sense. But if you've got it, then you can use that one green to create so many other color greens because you can have reds, blues, purples, yellows, oranges, browns, so many other different colors mixed with it, but you then change the dynamic of the green. You're still creating a green of some description, whether it's a lively one or a cool one or a gray green, it doesn't matter. But essentially the core can be very useful to you and that would be thalocyanin green. Now I'm mixing up a little bit of a hybrid, orangey, greeny, mm, what would you call it, a gunji color. But it's just to set up the shadow side of the corn rolls while I'm waiting for the trees to um, go off in the background so I can get another layer. And this painting really is all about layering. It's not about so much wet in wet. There are one or two areas of that happening. But essentially we are painting a layer we're allowing that to dry before we move on to the next layer. Now, if you want some spread in your paint, if you're adding a new layer and you want it to spread a little bit, then don't wait for that layer before to totally dry. If it's slightly damp or slightly moist, it will allow the paint to spread. And that's part of the, well, that's one of the biggest secrets of watercolor painting is understanding the wetness of your paper before you move on. It's not just about putting paint or watery paint or not so watery paint on. I, I, yes, it is. But it's also more about understanding how wet your paper surface is before you, can, you carry on painting and before you put the next layer on. And if you can understand that over time, and it's not something that... I'm going to sit here and tell you and, and you're just going to off and go and do. That's not going to happen. It comes with lots and lots of practice. So if you're prepared to do that and then try out and understand it on either main paintings or scraps of paper that have got wrecked and we all have them. I've done them. I've got a pile of papers that are wrecked. 
and I'm going off track. But what I'm saying is if you practice with these bits of papers, you don't have to make it an expensive exercise in using good paper. Just play around with bits of failures and test out the theory of wet and wet or less wet or damp and just see how paint moves in those different scenarios moving forward and you'll find that things like that or doing little exercises like that are a fantastic way forward i think what i might do is one of my videos coming up in the next few weeks i'm going to do just that i'm going to sit back not paint a picture but i'm just going to play around for you and show you what i mean about the way that the paper will react in different ways and how you can start understanding those ways by understanding how wet the paper is at any given time during the process of painting it. I've let this painting go on. I haven't told you too much about my color mixes, but you know the um, um, order of my paints. It's written down in the details below. So if there's a color that you're not sure I'm using, you've only got to look down that list and look at the video and it will be very evident as to which color I've just dived into. And I think one of those I picked up was uh, more raw sienna there. And it's a lovely yellow color. Um, it's not as bright as some, but it's an earthy color. And it can actually uh, lend itself in, in so many nice ways without getting into harsh cadmiums or transparent yellows like quinacridone or oreolin or Indian yellow. You see me teasing out different colors at different times and that's where I'm just trying to ease off the impact of an edge. Where I want something to be a little more subtle, I will let it go in and then I will tease it back with a damp brush and a little bit of water just to ease off the edge and let it blend into the white paper beyond. You're seeing me now putting a little bit of cadmium red into colors and some of the greens and a little bit of ultramarine violet but it makes it with that yellow go to a quite dull gray green. A little bit of a million going in it's well worth getting your mixes right before you proceed and I just wanted to darken up the top of this field and by doing that what I'm actually doing is setting the scene for the corn rolls in the foreground in very much the way the one on the left is being uh, isolated by the tree form behind it so too the darkened field is isolating the one in the foreground and therefore throws it out of the picture or makes it stand out makes it read right gives it that aerial perspective that we all look for when we're doing a landscape what i'm doing now is just laying in some of this dark color in the foreground remember all my colors or all of your colors indeed will dry lighter so think about that when you're putting a color in often i see students they put uh, lovely colors down but they work quite thinly and quite pastely and so it may look nice when it goes down wet but it dries up mm, so much lighter and they end up having to do the whole thing again or at least reinforcing the work that they've already started you'll see me do some of the same things you know we make a judgment we think we got it about right but indeed it's wrong and we have to go back in and reinforce that. But what you see me doing here is layering. I'm putting one layer of color over another one, mainly transparent colors, but each one allows the white paint below to come through. A little bit of nice, nice yellow form on top and um, that just strengthens the yellow but it can get a little bit too yellow so you've got to watch that. 
at the end of the day, that corner's got to mimic somewhat what is in the field too. So you see me lifting some of that out now. I felt that that was just a little bit too strong. And I think where we've left it now, by taking some of the pigment out, I think that eases it off. And when that dries, that will be even more subtle. I'm using a bit of cerulean blue now, just to give a nice complementary. When it hits that yellow, it's going to turn more green. But it gives some of that will still remain quite blue. But it gives a beautiful um, additional warm or cool color compared to the yellow that sets off the corn roll itself. We're not we're not anywhere near finished on the corn rolls, but you get the idea that it it just gives that extra uh, different temperature to the picture than the overall warmish colors in the field that surround the corn roll. Going back in with another layer now, and this is another darker layer, and we're using some of the generic darks that I've left on the paper. Some neutral tint, I think, went into that. Some umbers, bit of the blues that remain, and I'm picking up colors that are sort of generally on the palette that aren't being used in, the, in terms of a purpose. Lifting some of that back out, I don't want it to get too dark because I've still got to put some shadow areas below that corn roll and again on this side too. Nice thing about heavyweight paper is it allows you to keep working the painting long after you put that color down. And the paper stays quite damp and allows you to re, I don't know, reignite, re-wet the color and make it carry on working. Now I'm going back in with a darker value, not so green this time, a little bit more umber, a bit of neutral tint going in there to give me some more structure to the tree. And although I'm not trying to pick out individual trees, I'm just suggesting with the, the tip of the brush, little branches or trunks coming down to give it a little bit more form. So a little bit of greenish yellow going into one side to lift the color and lift the expectation on towards the light. But once more, we're reinforcing that dark value around that corn roll. And that additional dark just put in throws that corn roll even further forward. It just gives you that beautiful perspective aerially um, or atmospherically across the landscape. A little bit of uh, ultramarine violet going into the mix now just to cool it down as we go further away into the distance and that tree line or whatever it is at the top of the um, field and if you got up there it'd be quite a large tree form so uh, from this distance of course it looks nothing much more than a bush but uh, I'm trying to convey the sense that it is a little cooler than the tree forms in the foreground and again I'm teasing the brush in and making nice little shapes on the edge against the sky more of that um, cobalt uh, sorry cobalt ultramarine violet going in just to reinforce that cool color and darkness on the trees uh, in the middle ground here all the time I'm painting on this part yes it's all in my head at the time but I'm also looking at other areas as I work I'm looking to what I want to mix for the next painting a bit like playing chess in a way because you know you're sort of looking at the whole thing you're working the whole painting at the same time you're making decisions way ahead of where you are now you're thinking that you know we're doing this bit now that's for sure but you know I need to do this I need to do that and so you're planning for your next color mixes in your head as you're doing this one or at least I am anyway I don't know maybe you all paint very differently but for me, I sort of look at a painting and I'm planning and I'm looking at and I'm doing plein air outside and I'm looking at a scene and I'm, I'm planning the painting. I'm planning the drawing. I'm actually painting, planning the colors as I'm sketching. But often when I'm outside is another story. I don't draw with a pencil unless I'm doing a watercolor plein air. Uh, if I'm doing an oil plein air, then I draw with the paint. 
which is for me a very different process. Uh, watercolors is the only medium that I use a pencil for, uh, other than of course doing some graphite work. Now I'm going back in and reinforcing that corn roll with a darker value and the same on the one right in the foreground. And again, I will soften the edge so it's not going to be a very, very harsh edge. It will get softened. It may not be straight away, but the paper, as I said before, is quite forgiving and will allow you to do that. There we go. Damp brush, no pigment, and allow the water to do its thing and soften the transition between the light and the dark. After all, it's not got a crease in the roll. It's a subtle change. So you need to give it a subtle um, transition between the light and the dark, or vice versa. Using a lot of cobalt, uh, I keep saying cobalt, I do mean ultramarine violet. Ultramarine violet, and I think of it a neutral tint going in, to give me that heavier, dark, shady side to the corn roll. It's against the sun, but again, it just sets up the whole thing as a three-dimensional object sitting in the field in isolation. And that's what we're trying to convey. These uh, extremely heavy, very large objects that just adorn a field for a few days until the farmer uh, dictates that they get picked up and taken into store. And then there's just stubble, which is just ploughed in these days. Once upon a time, it used to be burned. And thank God that uh, it no longer is, because we've got enough with global warming uh, the world over without uh, burning crops after we don't need the stubble. So it's been proven over the uh, recent years that um, ploughing it in has not made any detrimental effect to farming practices, to my knowledge. So it's a, a very good thing. And the suspension of burning crops or old crop is long gone, thankfully. Anyway, I digress again. <laughs> I, I, I sort of ramble on a bit. I do apologise. But I'm using now some various browns, umbers, and different shades of different things there to suggest uh, furrows or tracks in the field. Now, they are tracks and furrows in the field, of course, but their purpose is that of lead-in lines. So you heard people talk of them before. I'm sure those of you who go to art lessons will have had teachers that will talk to you about things like composition and lead-in lines. Well, that's what this is. This is actually using furrows and lines in the field that will suggest a lead-in to the whole picture. And by lead-in, I mean that a device whereby you as the artist can create a um, subliminal message to the viewer to follow the line into the picture and move around the picture. You'll see the different lines move across here uh, off to the um, first bale, then other transitional lines which go across uh, to the second bale, and then again other lines that carry on all the way up to the top of the hill. And it doesn't really matter what you're painting, but whatever it is, then these divisive mechanisms to put into a picture will help the viewer move around your picture. It's more comforting to them to see. They don't know why. The brain does the rest, but it is certainly worthwhile considering when you're composing a picture in the future. Using divisive lines that lead people in and around your picture. It holds their attention. It keeps them interested and focusing. You can actually... One little thing I was told many years ago, if you're at a gallery uh, or an art show and you're watching people moving around the exhibits... And you can always tell the painting that has great composition, great color, uh, all these things uh, in its makeup. Because people are almost compelled to stand there and look at it. They are engaged by it. They don't know why, but they just are. And those pictures often the way people sort of look at and almost immediately walk on by, they don't 
carry all of those things. They don't actually have what's needed uh, to hold the attention of the viewer. And that can be a number of things. I'm not suggesting it's a bad painting. I'm simply saying that some of the divisive things like leading lines, good colour, great composition, all these little things hold people's attention and keep them standing in front of your painting a lot longer and before they move on. And let's face it, the more they look at your painting, the more they like it, there's always that chance they may well buy it. And that, at the end of the day, as an artist, what we really want people to be doing. If we're a professional artist, even if we're an amateur artist, we're doing a, a little local show. It's nice when people put their hands in their pockets and say, you know, I like that painting enough that I want to spend my hard-earned money on it. And, and what a feather in your cap as the artist if it's your painting they choose. I still get a buzz from it, even after all the years I've been painting as a professional. Anyway, I've rambled on and we're at the end of the painting. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please put comments in the bottom. That's fantastic if you would. And also, um, put the comments about what you might like me to paint. And don't forget to pop on over to my Patreon page. The link is in the details below. On my Patreon page, there are paintings there uh, in full time. And there are also some there that you've not seen or will not see on YouTube. They are unique to Patreon. And uh, you're free to look in there. It doesn't cost you any more than one or two cups of coffee a month to become a part of that and enjoy uh, a lot more content from me uh, moving forward. Anyway, I'm not. that's enough of that. But in the meantime... <laughs> Share this video, please, if you wouldn't mind. It would be great because if you've enjoyed it, it's nice to share it so that other people can enjoy it and get something from it. And it also helps to grow my channel. And on that score, if you're not a subscriber to my channel, please, please, please hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps me out tremendously. And it also tells you when there's another video up to watch. And while I've been gambling on about that, I've just added a few uh, crows or rooks in the distance all flying up, which is quite nice to see in the countryside. A nice flock of dark birds in the distance. They help and add something extra to the painting as well. So on that note, thanks ever so much for watching. I'll catch you all very, very soon on the next video. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for watching everybody. If you've enjoyed this, please hit the like button and uh, add your comments. They'll be very welcome and always answered. And if you're not a subscriber, please hit that subscribe button now. And for your information, there's another video there and another video there. All the best. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you all in the next video. Bye-bye for now. Bye.